Yeah. I don't understand. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on a beautiful September afternoon to sit indoors. Uh, but um, uh, it didn't occur to us to have this outside. We might have done it. Uh, but it's nice and cozy in here. And uh, it also allows us to invite our friends in Zoom land uh, to join us for what I am absolutely sure will be an exciting uh, and engaged conversation of an extraordinary, still, I think, new book. Mm -hmm. um, it came out this year. So um, uh, here's my copy. Uh, sex is as sex does, governing transgender identity by our dear friend and comrade, Professor Paisley Curra, who is with us from uh, the political science and women gender studies programs at Brooklyn College and who has written an absolutely stunning book. It is uh, brilliantly argued and beautifully written and asks us some very hard questions. Um, one of my favorite passages in a book that studied with them is in the third chapter on sex classification as a technology of governance. And I think in many ways this summarizes uh, the project of the book. The, the approach that animates this book focuses on contradictory decisions about sex classification at different agencies, jurisdictions, and levels of government. Because there are many distinct state actors creating rules for defining sex, it's not all that useful to direct all our attention to sovereignty and the state. Instead, understanding sovereignty as encircled by or folded into processes of governmentality might be more useful. Rather than focusing mostly on the inauguration of sovereignty and its constitutive exclusions, this approach considers sex classification in relation to traditional police powers and administrative apparatuses. Uh, unlike the political categories that are thought to pre-exist the moment of sovereignty's creation, traditional police powers really were always already there, even before the constitutive moment of a founding. Here, I read the tropes of sovereignty and the exception regarding lesser noticed and much less sexy apparatuses and domains of governmentality that even Michel Foucault found too dull to look into. Administration, unenumerated police powers, the population, norms of classification that precede inaugural moments, texts as dull as the Domesday Book, regulatory decisions and interpretive rules, and the US Social Security Administration's manual for field personnel. This approach also decenters the primacy of the idea of the state as singular. This is very heady stuff for uh, those of you who are law students or lawyers in the room because it challenges some of the most foundational assumptions that we make uh, about the state, about sovereignty, about law, and about the sovereignty of notions of unitary state power and of unitary law. So this book really uh, straddles several different fields all at once in ways that I think are pathbreaking and offer up a paradigm that I think will define uh, research programs in a number of fields uh, for some time to come as they bear on questions of how governmentality the conduct of conduct, as Foucault calls it, uh, deals with, uh, constructs, and then deals with, and orders and governs uh, 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 the whole question of sex. And so I'm really excited that we're here to be talking about the book, but also that we're here to be talking about Professor Kerr's book uh, with two extraordinary interlocutors uh, from Columbia Law School. Professor Catherine Frankie, who's here in her capacity as the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality Law, 
and Che Gossett, whom we're very fortunate to have in his second year uh, here at Columbia as a racial justice fellow for, uh, with the initiative for a just society. So you're in for a treat. Our format will be uh, that we'll hear from Professor Kerr for a few minutes. And after he speaks, I forget which order I said in the email. Do you remember? Uh, che, you're the youngest person here. Uh, and then one of them will talk. Uh, and then after one of them talks, the other will talk. And then after they talk, they'll talk a little bit amongst themselves. And then we'll all talk together. How's that? All right, so um, Paisley, you wanna start? You have a lavalier, so yeah. whatever's comfortable for you. All right, can people hear me? I think yeah. I'm gonna take off my mask and stand a little bit away from my I'm actually gonna panelists. invite you all to sit over here because it's oh, okay. so that you're not it's turning not, your neck. It's a good idea. Yeah. So, um, all right, so I kind of, that was such kind words that I'm like, who wrote those complicated words about sovereignty? I don't know. Um, I want to tell a story about New York City that I think helps um, illuminate some of the arguments I'm making in the book. And part of the story, it's so nice to hear everybody say this is such a great book, because part of the story of the book is really about how dumb I am and how long it took me to figure out a really simple premise. So it's like I have like an 11 year long aha moment, um, which I will explain to you. So. Um, so New York City, for weird reasons, is its own jurisdiction for issuing birth certificates. And uh, people in New York, administrative law lawyers in New York City can't even tell you why, because they've lost the history on that. But anyways, in New York City, over five decades, there were five different policies about sex classification on birth certificates. And so the first, the first kind of things happened in the 60s of some trans people went up to the city department of health and mental hygiene asked to get new birth certificates and they're like all right i guess whatever and then around the fourth or fifth person the department of health and mental hygiene was like wait is this a trend who are these people this is kind of weird so they commissioned a committee they asked a committee at the new york academy of medicine to figure out what should be the policy for transsexual people who want to have a different sex on their birth certificate. And it was really all transsexual women they were thinking of. So this committee composed entirely of doctors, met a few times, um, and they only talked about the legal aspects. They hardly ever talked about anything to do with medical stuff, but they talked about the legal aspects. And they decided back then that allowing trans people to get a new sex mark on their birth certificate would um, help them commit fraud against the public. The nightmare is that a transsexual woman would marry some unsuspecting cisgender man, and that would be terrible. And if a transsexual woman married a cisgender man who knew her history, that would even be worse. So, so they didn't change the policy. But eventually, in 1971, the ACLU kind of prodded the city, and the city said, OK, we will have a new policy. So I said, if you have a letter from a psychiatrist, you have this and that. And if you have a surgeon's report that you've had full convertive surgery, New York City is the only place that uses this word convertive surgery, we will issue you a new birth certificate, which was great, except the new birth certificate had no box for gender at all. So everybody else has a birth certificate that has a box that says sex, and then it says M or F. Trans people's birth certificate had no box. And then at the bottom, it said, this birth certificate has been changed pursuant to you know, rule 207.5, blah, 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 which is basically saying the person is transsexual. So in 1971, that policy was neither here nor there. By the turn of the century, New York City was, that was really a retrograde policy. Like New York City was sort of embarrassed because other states of the Midwest and places that New York thinks it's more advanced had changed their policies to let people get new birth certificates if they had surgery. So the city convened a committee um, the city committee committee, and like I was on it. I never knew if I was on it as an expert or advocate, but whatever. I was on it. Dean Spay was on it. We had some trans healthcare people on it. We had a couple of folks from Columbia on it, a urologist and an endocrinologist. Um, and the idea was to come up with a new policy. Um, the urologist, who was also a surgeon, guess what the surgeon thought should be the metric of gender? Not a surprise. Surgery. Uh, the endocrinologist was also kind of conservative. But the good thing is those guys made so much money in private practice. They were losing money coming down to these city meetings. So they only went to one meeting. So they didn't have a lot of they didn't have a lot of say. And we had, so so eventually we came up with a policy um, that said we should have, you know, the, the met, you know, the metric for sex change on your birth certificate should be gender identity. Uh, and the city wanted there to be some sort of letter from some sort of health professional. It wasn't perfect that we had to have some sort of letter, but it was something. 
And then we waited for two years, like just silence, radio silence. Dean Spade would keep emailing them and nothing would happen. And then finally, after two years, we found out that they've been shopping around different city agencies and the city agencies disagreed. They thought, yeah, this will work for our agency. No, this won't work for our, our agency. So the corrections agency was more conservative. The homeless services agency was less conservative, but the agencies, um, the agencies disagreed. So when we, we so what happened, so then they basically changed the policy that you can get a new birth certificate, you can get an M or an F, but you have to have surgery. So anybody, so a gender identity policy would it, wouldn't be good. Uh, so we thought this was a bad policy and we thought it was a transphobic policy and it certainly had transphobic effects. But one of the things I kind of came to realize slowly over time is that focusing on the harm to transgender people made it more difficult to understand the cities, or the, the states, in this case, the city, the city's reasoning for why they were doing what they were doing. Um, because like many people kind of, I can't kind of come, came up doing transgender advocacy and scholarship. And even though I'm sort of like supposed to be smart and lefty, I'm also kind of very much invested in transgender as an identity politic. So, um, so uh, my sense of this is like, oh, they're just being mean to trans people. That's not very nice. Um, but then I started stepping back and like looking into the records a bit more and doing a bit more research and thinking ab about it a bit more. And I came across, um, I came across this letter from like 1965 where the, this committee of doctors, they, 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 I almost said emailed, they wrote, they wrote a federal official department of health and human welfare and said, Hey, this is a thing that's happening about people wanting new birth certificates. What should we do? And the, 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 person at the Department of Health and Education at federal, the federal government said, you know what, I asked around, I asked people at different agencies and they couldn't provide any guidance, he, he said, because various agencies carry out different responsibilities and the problems that confront them differently, the problems that confront each agency with regard to sex change are different. So for some things like selective service, that would be kind of weird or social security, that would be weird. For other things like passports, it wouldn't be weird. So the answer was like, it kind of depends. Jump forward to 2011, this is sort of when I'm doing this research, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund sues the city saying, this policy is arbitrary, irrational, capricious, on and all these you know, law students, all those words you're supposed to put in there to say a policy is bad. Um, and the city lawyers replied and said, no, no, it's not irrational. They said the existence of different approaches to similar problems like sex classification does not render an agency's rule irrational. Well, so what they're saying is that we can have different Agencies could have different rules for changing people's sex, and that doesn't make our rule irrational. And this is the beginning, or this is like the middle of like my aha moment, because I was stuck with all the other advocates saying, this is what sex is, or gender, this is what it should be. It should be you know, looked at by as gender identity. We're like using scholarship, you know, different kinds of advocates and saying, this is what sex, sex is. And then I just realized like, that's not what the city bureaucrats were doing. You know, so I think I'm smart and I did, you know, my PhD at Cornell in the height of post-structuralist theory, and I read Foucault and Derrida, and then I realized the city bureaucrats are the real Foucauldians. Like, they're not upset about definitions of sex. They're really thinking about how changing the definition will change each agency's work. And like, we had not given any thought to that. So one of the, um, that's kind of where I, I get to the, like the, the, one of the main points of the book is like looking at like what sex is, that's like an interesting argument and what sex and gender is, and I'll talk about how I define it. Um, but that's not what, how city or how st the state officials are looking at it. They're looking at what it does and how it changes depending on the institution of government. That's not to say that a lot of these policies are transphobic. What it is to say is that the logics for them are different than we imagine often, oftentimes. Um, so in the United States, you probably all realize there's not any one, you know, universal definition for like how people, how the state should recognize your sex. In the book, I decided to just use this word sex because like I, I was just, a, a friend of mine was commenting on my book at a conference recently and she said, you can re look really hard, but you will find no ontological claims whatsoever in this book about gender or sex. Like I'm just not about into making any claims, but I decided like I will just limit the sex to like sex is defined in the book as the, uh, as the uh, output or the effect of a government decision about whether you're M or F. So it's just like a decision backed by the force of law about your status. That's all sex is for the purposes of this research. Um, and so different agencies can have different, uh, d different uh, definitions. And um, as I was working on the book, I was like, right, we have people like 
who could have an M, have an M on their driver's license and an F uh, on their birth certificate and then be like an F for the purposes of marriage. Like how can we have these contradictions? And my original, my initial thing is to think that's a contradiction that needs to be solved. Let me kind of like figure out how to solve that contradiction um, and point that out. And that's kind of what a lot of trans scholarship in the early days of the century kind of was. But I go back to like um, um, Stuart Hall. He's like a Marxist cultural critic who, who's no longer with us, but he had this really smart critique of academics and Thatcher, Thatcher's England. He was like, academics think that if they just point out the contradictions and Thatcherism, the whole edifice will just crumble and fall. And it's like, no, no. Thatcherism has no problem dealing, you know, uh, being contradictory in how it treats the individual in society. And then similarly with trans, the, the transgender rights movement, I think it's important. The identity pol politics movement is helpful. It's a useful way to frame it. But if we have that as a protagonist, a transgender person, we lose track of the whys of what's happening. So my point is like, put the transgender person who's being harmed to the side provisionally and focus on the state apparatuses that are producing these different definitions of sex. And so one example of the policy preferences would be a Department of Motor Vehicles, Department of Motor Vehicles across the United States were the earliest to change their policies and the earliest to drop uh, hard requirements. So the earliest to say you can change your sex and the earliest pretty uniformly, though there's some differences, to say you don't need surgery or you just need a doctor's letter. Um, and so that, you know, so those policies are like less transphobic. At the same time, the early in the aughts, there are all these kind of appellate decisions involving transgender people in marriage. So a lot of trans people get married in opposite sex marriages. Most of them, you know, they stay together, they get divorced, nothing much happens. But in a few cases, these, these marriages, the status of these marriages were litigated because, you know, marriages, when they dissolve, can be um, not friendly. And uh, sometimes property is at stake. And in almost all the cases that were litigated and reached the appellate level, the decisions were negative. So a trans person who changed all their identity documents and had, say, a trans man who had married a, a woman, a cis woman, changed all his identity documents, the court would say, yeah, but for the purposes of marriage, we're going to go by assigned sex at birth. So one of the most famous cases is the case of Christy Lee Littleton in Texas. She's married to this fellow who dies in the hospital, and she sues the hospital fellow for malpractice. And the insurance company lawyers, very smart, maybe they were Columbia Law grads, they were like, huh, we don't like this case. And they were like, huh, she's a transsexual woman. So she's really a man. So her marriage is actually a same-sex marriage. Therefore, it's not really a marriage. Therefore, she has no standing to sue. Like, you've got to admire the creativity there. And of course, an appellate court, not the highest, but an appellate court in, in, in Texas agreed. They said, God cannot, or a surgeon cannot change with a scalpel what God has created at birth. That is the judicial rhetoric in the state of Texas. Um, and similarly, we see other cases when, some, when there's property at issue, like uh, fighting over... Um, inheritance or child custody at issue, the trans people were always losing. So one of the points in the book is that rather than see the DMV's policies as nice to transgender people, we might see them as like, it's actually in the, in the interest of the state to be able to recognize people and have them walk around with the right identity documents that kind of reflect who they are in terms of surveilling populations and tracking people. So that's why the policies were good. It's nice that they weren't transphobic, but that might've been an accidental effect. Marriage, however, before we have same-sex marriage, is an instrument, well, it's all about lovey-dovey, right? But it's also an instrument for like to regulate the transmission of property. And so trans people lose out in those circumstances when there's something, um, there's resources to be lost. So um, I'm going to end with one more point about, the, about identity politics. So in New York City, in 2018, we get to that kind of nirvana of the birth certificate policy. Mayor de Blasio says, you know what? You can just change your birth certificates, just fill out a form. You can have M, you can have F, you can have X. So the trans community is ha happy. There's press releases, there's speeches, there's people showing up at events thanking de Blasio, and he's giving a speech about the importance of transgender New Yorkers. So that's good, that is good. Um, but in the city, when you're born in a hospital, when a baby is born, it is still assigned an M or an F by the doctor on the long form that becomes the information that goes on the birth certificate. So the kind of architecture of sex classification isn't radically shifted. It's just like, oh, trans people want this. We're gonna give them that. 
but everybody else is still going to be fitting into the kind of traditional binary based um, sex classification system. So that what that point is, again is even like even identity politics kind of produces particular results that don't necessarily um, radically restructure the whole system. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop stop there. So. Uh... Uh, Shay, why don't you take the high, one of the high chairs, I'll sit to the side, because that way uh, folks can see you, and each of you can have a mic. I cut that off, Catherine. Um, and Shay will start, uh, we'll hear first from Che Gossett, and then from Catherine Frank. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kendall. Um, thank you, Paisley. Thank you, Catherine. Um, it is such a delight to be here to celebrate this book, um, all of your work. I had uh, the pleasure uh, of getting an early trailer or preview of the book when I think we met for the first time, actually, um, at the Brudner Prize panel. Um, this, this year, actually. So it's nice to see this finalized form and read the whole rest of this profound argument. Um, so congratulations and um, what a contribution. And I think, you know, it's titled uh, Sex Is As, as Sex Does. And um, there's a, a great, well, I'll just have to pull up my phone because I'm the youngest person. So let me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like, um, you know, you say on page nine in this book, I focus not what, on what sex is, but what sex does, this kind of way to, um, you know, turn sex from a noun to a verb and to think about what it animates and enacts and puts into motion. And I think that's a really powerful point. I think also it's, you know, sub a subtitle could be the state is as the state does because of the ways in which you, to use a Foucauldian point, like cut off the head of the king. And you kind of push back against or demystify the state itself and shift the optics and political theoretical coordinates away from this idea of the state as this kind of, you know, um, one thing, uh, this, concretized, I don't know, like Leviathan, basically. And instead, you're extending Foucault to give us a way to think about the bio necro politics of the state and also it's what Dean Spade would call it's um, administrative violence. And I really appreciated not only what you're writing, but how you're writing it. And so I think that you offer so much thick description of these bureaucratic systems that trans people, poor, um, of color, black, have to navigate. Uh, one of the, <clears throat> including especially for me at least in my work, that includes like scholarship and then also um, political organizing, the prison system. And, uh, you know, here in New York, an organization that existed um, was Queers for Economic Justice. And they did a lot of work. Jay Toole, who was a trans organizer who was around during like Stonewall, kind of a big force in New York City, um, would like do a lot of really important work around going to shelters and like where trans folks couldn't enter because of these binary systems of exclusion that you so beautifully lay out and oppose. Um, and then also the welfare system. So people being rejected from getting welfare benefits because of uh, the way that the bureaucratic um, kind of operator viewed their gender as incongruent. Um, and so I thought that that was a really, uh, you're kind of showing how these systems work how trans becomes a kind of a aporia within the system 
causing all these internal con structural contradictions um, and breakdowns really, I thought was really uh, profound. Uh, and I guess you also do it in a way that's not just like, um, you know, high theory or like getting lost in the woods, but you also personalize it and you speak from the autobiographical and even the auto eth ethnographical. So I, I just, I, you know, I wanted, I ha had some questions like, you know, what is the role for you in this writing of the work or the labor of the, that kind of subjective writing, that, that kind of um, autobiographical, autoethnographical, and what does that add? You personalize this. Why did it matter to tell your story as opposed to this kind of like pseudo objective scholarly approach? Um, another question I had uh, was um, Miss Major, who's a, a black trans radical activist, talks about how she like switched her ID recently, her license. I think this is like a couple years ago from uh, female back to male. And it made me think about like, you know, uh, I don't know, I think maybe summer of 2020, there was all this slogan about like becoming un ungovernable. And so I'm wondering, you know, are there ways that you feel like transness exceeds maybe the very grammars of capture articulated by the state that you are so uh, cogently laying out for us. And my last two questions are about like disciplines. Um, your work is such a contribution to, uh, you know, trans studies, to um, legal theory. And I'm wondering um, for you, where do like trans studies and legal studies, critical legal theory line up? And, you know, there's a lot of like, um, maybe even conflict in, in trans studies about that mirrors and, and is an extension of like what happens when a, a political identity gets folded into the academy and what are the risks of that form of like, how, how can that be a form of domestication or how can it stay radical? What are some of these tensions and maybe you can elaborate on that or the importance of it. And then the last two questions are, um, uh, just briefly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for talking so long, uh, but okay. Um, like, so on the one hand, um, and it's not like a rose colored glasses uh, version of reality at all, but you lay out, and I felt like I learned a lot about like um, the kind of codification of transness at min municipal all the way to federal level. But there are these certain um, legal forms of recognition uh, that happen that change like what people have access to. Um, and that does change people's lives. On the other hand, you also speak to how that can be kind of rolled back. And so I'm wondering, um, like, do you see a tension between these modes of uh, legal inclusion and also the kind of anti-trans lawfare that we see right now happening across the country and also in the South, perhaps in particular, um, and the role of lawyers in, in this process. So that, those are my questions. Thank you so much for this generative, um, your, your thought and, uh, and book. Memory. <laughs> um, oh yeah, but these are all such good questions. So there's so much going on there, but like the, the idea of thick description of bureaucratic systems, like, you know, I have this idea of like writing a next, uh, a second book that is more popular that will help pay for my kid's college. But if I could do what I really, really wanted, I would just do like more ethnographic studies of weird teeny little bureaucratic processes. Sometimes at Brooklyn College, I have my my honor seminar do political ethnography of like applying for a passport or you know trying to get welfare, like really deep thick descriptions because there's so much going on at the level of administration in the state. And I worry in trans studies that's, that there's things have been lost because 
Jay probably knows, but like there's, there was so many histories and I, I have some of these documents, but you know, you don't think of saving things like, you know, 30 years ago, about people giving each other advice about how to get their identity document changed. Like go to this clerk on this day in that county. And so like a binary trans person will go to this clerk on that day in this county and say, look at my driver's license. It says, F, what a crazy mistake. And they'd be like, oh, that is crazy. We need to change that. They would always say like little folk ways of changing things. Or they'd go to the other clerk who had a trans sister who would surreptitiously change this. Or like, Joanne Meyerowitz has done a great job of talking about how like the medical doctors, they all, they all thought their narratives of transsexuality in the 1950s were so perfect because all their patients came to them, 1950s and 60s and 70s, all their patients came to them with the exact same narrative. And of course, they had the exact same narrative because they were sharing it. And it didn't occur to these surgeons and doctors that, in fact, that was happening. And this is pre-internet. So I just think that's so important. And going back to um, uh, putting myself in there as autoethnographic, like, I'm not a very smart person, but I figure things out slowly through doing things myself. So, like, I could read Foucault and I would make my grad students read all those damn lectures every year. But, like, talking to those bureaucrats in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, like you just get it in a way you don't get it. Um, when I, you know, like, so I didn't really, I couldn't really have those insight, insights without having my, my feet in, in that kind of grounding. And um, yeah, there's a weird, so a couple of weird moments where I talk in the book about trying to get identity documents changed. And like, I have so much privilege. I have middle class, you know, you're a CUNY professor. Have you ever talked to someone at, who works for the city? They all went to CUNY. So you'll automatically have that status. You know, I'm white, I'm binary looking, all that sort of stuff. And then, I, but I would still feel totally scared and vulnerable. So it's just, I think it's really good to kind of understand, like if that's happening for me, imagine what's happening for people who don't even have the wherewithal to make it in the front door. Um, so that, I think that kind of, I appreciate um, Chase's point about that. I, you know, I do worry a little bit at that kind of subjective writing, because I don't know if many of you have seen the Dean Spade's first great article called Mutilating Gender. It's published, I don't know when, a long time ago. Uh, and it's super smart, but it used to be, you know, how publishers do, they just, they excerpt bits of it. They would excerpt all of his autobiographical stuff and they'd leave the theory out because the trans person is not theory producing. A trans person is just a piece of data. So like, you, you can't go very far in my book without, you couldn't really get, you couldn't just excerpt the experience out of my book. But I do, that, you know, that does happen to, to people coming um, from outside the traditional identities. Um, the un ungovernable part, I think, is really important. One of the one of the things I talk about in the book, not too much, but is the idea of like, what does it mean that we want to be recognized by the state? You know, what does it mean that we like when the police officer says, "Hey, you," we turn around and then we can hand over the right driver's license with the right sex marker on it? Like, you know, like I understanding like that kind of recognition means we want to be governed. You know, I mean, you're talking to someone who can't even sneak food into a movie theater. So I certainly want to be governed in that sense. I don't take a lot of risks, but I like the, I like the idea of um, transness exceeding these grammars of capture. And we used to see a little bit in people in like lawyers and advocates, literally lying to the state on documents, like trying to get their non-binary person, a Medicaid covered gender affirming surgery, which wouldn't have been covered if they were, it, back in the day as non-binary, but they would just say, oh, this person is a transsexual man or a transsexual woman. So I think like that kind of lying to the state is like in those little moments of resistance is important. There's this political scientist named James Scott who spends a lot of time writing about that. Um, um, in terms of the disciplines um, and being domesticated in the academy, like it's, it's, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Like, so I, you know, I came up doing queer studies and now trans studies. And I, with Susan Stryker, I founded this transgender studies journal and I get to publish this book and people invite me to give talks. So I'm like pretty domesticated and I'm happy to be slightly domesticated in the sense of like, um, in my discipline of political science, they just treated me like some weird cretin for like 30 years and they would literally refer to me as it, you know? So I'm happy in some sense that trans studies has become um, domesticated, but I, I don't know the answer to like not being co-opted. I don't know um, how we can kind of keep fresh and radical. I think one of the problems with even identity politics in the academy, which is sort of identity critical, is that class drops out so quickly out of all of our analysis uh, and we're rewarded for that. Um, you know, we, we went to that Brunner event and then we went to this really fancy restaurant and I was like, wow, we're being taken to a fancy restaurant and they're like, ordering bottles of wine and the whole restaurant just felt like it was full of like visiting speakers from mail and everybody was running up big bills. 
And it just like, it was this lovely example of like, you know, all these kind of different social differences in university, but like there was, there's no boring sociologist dude writing about socioeconomic status or class. Like, it's just like an example of like, there's some things that you still can't, that don't get celebrated as much. And I thought it wasn't, wasn't a total coincidence that like a place that like Yale is interested in celebrating certain kinds of diversities and not others. So I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's my response, but such great comments and such good questions. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Jay, thank you for getting us started so thoughtfully on um, what the book does and what it is. It's a pleasure to be on the panel with you. Um, just a few more questions, really not um, um, gotchas, <laughs> just, which is not the point of these gatherings. Just to follow up on a couple of things that Che mentioned, um, I think it's, I guess I want to know a little bit more about the, the, um, the impulse to do, to weave the personal narrative into the story, particularly for a trans scholar where trans bodies are so spectacular themselves to so many people. And um, to, to be, to, we were, I was talking about this earlier with a, with a trans scholar, um, not like an hour ago, of you're in an academic context and people want to talk to you about your body. They want to touch your body. They want to know what you've done to your body. They want to know what this monstrous thing is. And um, I think it's a, it, has, it has so much more weight, I think, for a trans scholar to do that. Um, while I, I also appreciate the fact that you're weaving theory together with the real world and understand how important those are. So I just love to know more about, about the thinking about that. And maybe at that fancy dinner at Yale, you got some of that creepy kind of interrogation of who you are and why. Um, but I, I just want to acknowledge that, that I think trans scholars do that at great risk and against a, a backdrop of the body, not the mind being what's it, what's being interrogated or being presented. Um, I, another thing I enormously admire about you is over the course of your work, you've really evolved your positions on all of this. this I mean, I was so looking forward to reading the book when it came this summer, because um, I thought, all right, let's see where Paisley is now in your thinking and in a book length project as opposed to articles that you wrote earlier. And we've talked about this um, um, uh, uh, before, uh, just on the level of funny anecdote, um, I remember showing up at that panel at the Law and Society Conference, I think it was, at eight in the morning on a Sunday, and you and Shannon were giving a paper um, attacking my work. <laughs> and um, I think the thought was I wasn't going to show up, or maybe you didn't know I was there. <laughs> so I just was showing up out of solidarity, and then I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll go to get a coffee. But um, you and I had very different views on what the, what the law ought to be doing around the the, the question of justice for trans people. And the two of you took a very strong position that we ought to enumerate trans identity in non-discrimination laws in the laundry list. And I had at that time the position that, that the concept of gender stereotyping could do enough of the work and that adding more categories succumbed to a kind of identity politics that was problematic in other ways. And, and, um, and I think both of us have moved how we think about this um, since then, and and the, your critique really provoked me to to reexamine my position. So I just really admire how how rich your thinking is, and how how the kind of humility that is that um, inspires how you how you operate as a scholar and a person. Um, chapter one really talks to us about how um, sex is a technology of. Um, uh, and a um, ideology of patriarchy in important respects. Chapter two talks about how sex is a technology of the state, how it's an administrative apparatus. And I really like to know more about how these two conceptions of sex, I mean, you know, I'm totally with the project of sex being a technology, it's, it's absolutely right, but how they relate to each other. How, when you write late in the book that sex classifications are there to further state projects, um, 
how does that relate to the idea that sex is there as a classification to further the project of patriarchy, which I think you're also committed to? So what's the relationship between patri patriarchy and the state, I guess? And in that sense, as I was reading your book, I reluctantly, but did, pull Catherine McKinnon <laughs> off the shelf um, because she, I felt there's a lot of her in here. And I and I want to invite you to think about where where what you what insights you share with hers with hers and she's you know brilliant in so many ways and so wrong in so many others, um, um, but I think we owe a lot to her thinking, um, you know also to Eve Sedgwick and the other wonderful people that you cite in the book who were not wrong, <laughs> um, in the ways that McKinnon was. But I pulled out difference and dominance, um, and. Um, to, just to think how this was, what you were writing resonated so much for with her analysis as well. <clears throat> so just as an example, she says, um, um, it is as if a vacuum boundary demarcates sexual issues on the one hand from the law of equality on the other. Law structurally adopts the male point of view. Sexuality concerns nature, not social arbitrariness, interpersonal relations, not social distributions of power, the sex difference, not sex discrimination. She goes on from there to critique the, you know, a binary and the work that it does um, and how classifications are about that, or that she won't use Foucauldian language like technology, but certainly that's equally important to her. And then, and, and what really was, I was just tearing in my, uh, echoing in my head as, as I was reading the book is her very powerful rhetoric of, on the first day that matters, dominance was achieved, probably by force. By the second day, division along the same lines had to be relatively firmly in place. On the third day, if not sooner, differences were demarcated together with social systems to exaggerate them in perception and in fact, because the systematically differential delivery of benefits and deprivations are required um, making uh, required making no mistake about who was who, and that's so. I think similar to some of the the analysis that you had, but she is such a deep structuralist and a materialist. Writing really before Foucault, although I think post Foucault, there's not a lot of Foucault in her work, um, but yours is so informed by a post structuralist analysis. So, in what ways um, do you feel there's overlap with what she's doing? Um, uh, and, and in other ways, uh, how is it different? Um, uh, and in, in what ways are, are you prepared to, to reject the kind of materialism of her, of her writing? Um, another thought that came to mind as I'm reading the conclusion, um, and this sort of plea for a transgender umbrella, um, uh, kind of identity that makes a coherent politics, um, uh, possible a politics of identity possible without compressing, as you say, disparate non-normative genders into a single legible figure, and then including the scare quote wrong body, transgender men and women. How is that? How is that possible? How is that identity politics possible? I'm, I, I'm, I didn't get there by the end of the um, uh, by the end of the book. Um, uh, in what way is transgender umbrella, this idea, um, whatever it is, not a reference to that which is, it's not, it's constitutive other, but somehow escapes the, the gaze, to borrow another idea from McKinnon, of that constitutive other. Because um, I think you, you do want to do that, but how does that, how does that work? How do we hold on to identity politics and let go of it at the same time? Um, so how does, how does, tr how does trans, as you conceive it, accomplish this kind of decoupling from, from the, its constitutive other, which in McKinnon's framing always already remains the measure of all things? So there is no outside for her. Um, and um, you know we have the benefit of other writing and thinking that will help us see an outside, or at least play in the joints, that I think um, McKinnon never could. Um, Next point is um, you end the book like unlike most of people who write like we do, you end it, your book on a hopeful note <laughs> rather than just a, a desperately um, um, uh, apocalyptic one. But you end with this idea that the trans umbrella can accommodate a kind of gender pluralism 
that slips the knot of the gender binary and promises um, a kind of refreshing, refreshingly liberal idea of gender autonomy, um, if not freedom. Um, to the extent that this sexual binary that we all have made careers critiquing um, uh, is a state project and is a project of patriarchy, um, as you lay it out, I think, so beautifully in, in really the whole book, but certainly the early part of the book, um, in what way is there a role left for the state in the business of, if nothing else, naming a person's gender? Is the state merely an inactive recipient of information or facts established complexly elsewhere, or is there any role for a more active state um, that is justice enhancing and not transphobic, as opposed to injustice perpetuating and absolutely transform, tra uh, transphobic? So um, in that respect, and I'm going to put on my law professor hat, um, what about rights? Um, can the state remain involved in the project of a rights-based form of gender or trans-based justice, or is rights itself a sus as suspect as a state project, um, as um, is already is in all the other ways in which we are disciplined and governed um, uh, 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 violently, as you describe um, so well in the book? So... Um, Interestingly, related to this, and I feel like these are somewhat random thoughts, but that what is what it is to do a, a critique of a, or just engage a book, right? You you offer us early in the book that, um, this relates to my last point, um, we now find ourselves in a new political moment, one in which transgender rights have been enrolled in the newest eruption in the culture wars, which some had hoped had been brought to an end with Obergefell. And I was like, wait, I must have read that wrong. That the culture wars would have been brought to an end with Obergefell. So are the rights that were secured in Obergefell, a constitutional right for same-sex couples to marry, ones that would somehow put to rest some of the, the violence and, and, and problem of discipline and governance that you write so convincingly of, um, uh, or the culture wars that lift them up? Um, and so how was, how was Obergefell going to come to the rescue? Um, and then the last comment, um, as you were doing your description early in the, in your presentation on, you know, why the book, what personally, in terms of your own experiences inspired so much of the motivation for writing the book, but also the, the analysis of the book, you talk about the state, um, as, uh, as a kind of bureaucratic, set of actors like the person at the DMV and the person at the marriage office and the person who's handling benefits, et cetera. Um, but there are lots of other kinds of states. Um, those folks are kind of benign and as you said, often can be helpful because you can connect to them as a human in role. And they might step out of role for a moment because of that connection to you as a human. Um, but then there's Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott and the Texas legislature, which are also the state um, I think there is no stepping out of role for them. And that's a much more um, toxic or at least different kind of state than the kind of state that you were describing earlier, these, these, inst these instrumentalities of the state. And, and, and so I guess the, where this all takes me to is, do you have or do you need a theory of the state in a book like this? You know, that's what McKinnon tries to do. We can argue about whether it was successfully, but that's the project. And um, I don't think that's your project in this book. Um, but do you need one that can take on the nuance of what the state is, how it acts, what its technologies look like, what ideologies lift it up, um, and how it might be implicated in the justice project if we agree with everything you say in the book? I'll stop. Right. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much. Those were such interesting, smart remarks, and there's a lot to say about them, and I might not get to all of them, but um, in terms of the point about like writing about myself, like I think a couple of times I talk about going to the DMV and I have this letter for surgery. This is being recorded on a live stream, but whoever. So um, so it's like, so it's like pe people are reading the book is like, oh, he said surgery, but I don't say what kind of surgery I've had, right? And this is like 
resonates with the whole strategy of these letters, right? So these doctor's letters were always written by lawyers and the lawyers would obfuscate. So they would say, this person has had all the surgery they need, which from a layperson's perspective means like the whole thing. And from a trans healthcare perspective could mean none, right? Or so what, so I think I'm kind of doing when I talk about myself, what trans activists and, or trans people are kind of doing when they confront the state, which is like obfuscating, you know? Um, so, but yeah, my body, you know, becomes something people probably think about, which I never thought about until you mentioned that. <laughs> but anyways, thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's okay. Um, but um, I think it was just kind of important to kind of enact the kind of analysis I was I was doing. Um, it's pretty funny, Catherine, remembering Shannon and I at the Law and Society meeting. We had a great time staying in Miami Beach in this hotel that like had fleas and rats. And um, I do remember that conference. And um, and the thing is like, you know, we were kind of making the stand for like a transgender identity. And I think it was ultimately a failed project. I think Catherine's critique was right. But in the context, it's in this context of this larger attempt to like erase trans people, um, not only from the right, but from the left. So this book is in some sense, it, I kind of think it was like ultimately a kind of critique of left neoliberalism. Um, in terms of like identity politics, all that. In another sense, like I do not want any Williamsburg bros to ever read this book because I don't want it to authorize their critique, like this cisgender dude's critique of trans identity politics. Like, oh, why are those losers trying to get their documents changed and their driver's license? Um, because that kind of that, that kind of like basic ability to navigate social life and the kind of rights that people need it. Um, it, it, it can't be it can't be just kind of theorized away. So part of I mean part of our initial stuff was a little bit like um, against the right and the left. And part of it is like if you can if, you, if the bros can go get their tickets to the national or whatever, and you, you know use their credit card and their driver's license, um, they don't think about the kind of privileges they have in, in doing that. And then trans people are just trying to kind of access the social services without those kind of documents have a different perspective. Um, in terms of um, the, the idea of the patriarch of the stake, like I, I'm really just talking about sex classification. So I, I don't talk about gender. Maybe that's a different project. So gender is the thing that fuels the sex classification. These larger histories and narratives and a ways of ways of arranging difference. That is the engine that fuels all these like ways that sex turns into the technology of government. But I don't really spend much time on that because I'm I wasn't really interested in talking about gender. I feel like so many people talk about it. Other people can do it better. And I was really interested in my particular teeny little problem. Um, you know, so like the hedgehog knows one big thing. The fox knows many little things. Like I am beyond a fox. Like all I care about is teeny little things. That is, you know, so like I kind of shy away from larger narratives. I mean, I'm a political theorist, so once in a while I'll throw some stuff in there, but I try to like not do big things because like, I think other people do a, do a better job at do a better job at that. Um, the McKinnon stuff is, I think that's really great that you mentioned it. And one of the things I'm trying to do in the conclusion of the book is I'm talking about gender pluralism and how it's we've moved away from like evaluating people's narratives, like you know, born in the wrong body, not born in the wrong body, and that we've we've got this kind of pluralistic situation. But one of the things I do in the conclusion is say like that's also sort of dangerous because it can easily kind of devolve into like a kind of like neoliberal, like, oh, I can create myself. I'm pretty, you know, putting myself into this, um, you know, new technologies of sex and gender and, you know, branding myself. And no, there's anything wrong with that. But one thing that, one thing that gets lost in that is the, is gender asymmetry, right? So men get more stuff than women a uh, lot of the times. So I think the conclusion I refer to the fact that millennials support trans rights 20% points higher than they support abortion rights. And there's just something weird going on. That, that poll is maybe three or four years old now. But there's something weird going on where we can like have this celebration of gender difference and gender pluralism, but the kind of still fundamental kind of asymmetry of gender relations is something that has somehow become untheorizable. So one of the things I'm trying to do in the conclusion is like, we need to kind of go, be able to kind of theorize uh, uh, re this relationship to patriarchal structures and misogyny. And one of the arguments in the book that I didn't really get into, but you know, transgender stuff narrates itself as like, you know, this identity politics movement, we were harmed, we come forward, 
And one of the things it doesn't do very often is acknowledge its debt to liberal feminism because trans stuff is cool right now. Liberal feminism is like absolutely not cool. So why acknowledge that debt? But in fact, all the kind of fights to get the state or the business of giving men more stuff than women had a positive effect on the transgender rights movement with the, with the culmination um, of a of Burgerfell. Um, okay. Okay, I think I'm not going to respond to all your points because I want to leave time for, for there to be questions and discussion. But thank you so much. I, really great comments. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. So there are so many questions to be asked. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Um, I was struck, actually, Paisley, by one thing you said about the bureaucratic state, that it was neo Foucauldian. And if it's Neil Foucaultian, it's Foucault on steroids, because the story that you tell from the New York story is a story in which the state isn't saying no, it's not about prohibition, but it's not categorically saying uh, in every and uh, each instance, yes, either. It's saying, I think you use the, 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 the phrase, it depends. And uh, that for me raises the question, uh, not what the state is th through what it does, right? To what extent is this a story that we can understand about how the state elaborates and represents itself, not just to its citizens, but to itself? In that regard, um, I thought, you know, this is maybe a very American story, right? Because you have all these jurisdictions by virtue of our federalist system treating the same questions in radically different ways, right? Um, and so I thought uh, that that it might be interesting to hear what you have to say about uh, whether this story travels. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Bruno Perrault, who's up at uh, MIT, called The Politics of Adoption, in which he does a kind of genealogy of French adoption policy, and he notes that one of the things that these bureaucrats who are making these decisions uh, on behalf of the French state or as the French state, uh, one of the things that these bureaucrats seem to be pursuing as a state project is an elaboration of ideas of Frenchness. Right? And so I want to ask um, a kind of nationalism question. To what extent is the story you're telling one that we can or should understand as being a story about how America does sex uh, in ways that might differ radically um, from how other places do sex, and which is a story about um, how states or the state does sex in America that is at heart entirely consistent with our dominant philosophy, which is uh, pragmatism, right? Uh, which can accommodate no. Yes, maybe, and it depends, right? All at the same time, uh, in a way that is different from Margaret uh, Thatcher's high tolerance, uh, high threshold of tolerance for contradiction. I mean, in a sense, the American story is one that doesn't even, it, it doesn't recognize the principle of contradiction, right? Because it can accommodate in a purposive way, in a pragmatic way, uh, radically different answers to what appear to be the same questions from up here, but which on the ground are very different questions. And while you're working through that, I'll allow people to sort of raise their hands and I can get a sense of who in the room wants to ask a question. Okay, I, I took, yeah, I took, you want my um, Yeah, such good questions. Um, in terms of the theory of the state, this kind of gets to what Catherine was saying too, like, I don't have one, I'm sort of against one. I'm against, what I have is like, a theory of what's wrong with theories of the state. Like the idea that the state is unitary, rational, hierarchically organized, and non-contradictory. So that's my only theory of the state. But this book does focus on like state practice at the level of administrative law, especially like the board ministry of the better and bureaucratic stuff. And what's happening now with the politicization of transgender identity through legislators, which, you know, they weren't really in my category of the state until like recently. Like, these legislators who had no idea that their states were issuing new birth certificates. Suddenly, like in Oklahoma, they're like, oh my God, that can never happen. They just passed a law that said they will never issue a non-binary birth certificate to anybody ever born in the state of Oklahoma. So like legislators have now 
It usurped the position of like policymakers, data-driven science, all that sort of stuff, and are just purely kind of invoking these larger gender regimes and schemas to kind of re regulate. And, and it looks like it's a regulation. It looks like it's again the regulation of sex, and it is, but it's really about re-prosecuting larger gender wars. So what is it? What it is to be a man, and what is it to be a woman? That's what we see in these anti -sport, these anti-trans sports bills, for example, where this kid in Utah wins a competition. And the other parents say, investigate her, she might be trans. And they go back through her school records to kindergarten. She's not trans, but she's not gender conforming. So it's like, it's not so much about attacking the trans people, it's about regulating what it is to be, you know, properly feminine in a woman. So anyways, about, so that gets to my point about the state. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for your talk. And I look forward to uh, reading the book in due course. Um, I, my question comes from uh, experience in the UK working in litigation um, to some extent within sort of trans rights and particularly concerning registration of birth certificates. And throughout that work, what I kind of saw was that before the attention of litigation became a focused on sort of really defining what the law should be, people who are working within the administrative agency of um, of uh, giving sort of birth certificates to, to transgender uh, parents and sort of deciding whether they should be classified as male or female on birth certificates acted on, in very arbitrary ways. There were some individuals who were kind of like letting it slide and some, uh, and it was only really at the point where litigation brought real attention that the internal inconsistencies within this, these administrative agencies came into place. And I feel as though, you know, your, your book and your work is thinking about how these inconsistencies operate between different agencies in different states and how we have this, you know, so many different ways in which sex is being classified. But there is also a story how within these internal agent, uh, within these sort of administrative agencies, we also have individual actors doing their own thing. And I was just wondering how they, they sort of can fit into this story about states of classification are they themselves agents of the state you know having this more interpersonal relationship yeah. or are they sort of subverting the whole system um yeah anyway. i think no that's a really good question it's an important question in political science there's this kind of foundational text called street level bureaucrats and it talks about how like teachers police officers caseworkers are actually producing policy all the time on the fly and the policy is not articulated it's not written down but it because it's repeated, it's a practice. But then you could go to a different person on a different day and it's a different practice. So there needs to be, and I don't really, I think I've talked about it a little bit, but not much. There needs to be kind of more analysis. And again, like we'd just love to see more kind of ethnographies of how those different, um, they, you know, political scientists are shitty, sorry. Political scientists are not good at this. Anthropologists are the ones who do the best kind of work on the practices that produce states and produce these different norms of behavior. So I think there's there's gotta be more, more work on that. It's really hard to do though, because no one wants to tell their secret story of how they managed to get a document changed. Um, but I mean, it'd be good to collect them. In New York State, a bunch of us went up to Albany to talk to them before they changed their policy about how to, how to you know, to change their policy. And they were super nice, you know, public health officials, they went to medical school and then they're working for the government. So they're not bad people. They're trying to pay, you know, they're, they're like public health officials trying to make the world a better place. Their thing was like, oh, when we get a request for someone to change their birth certificate, we just think, oh, the doctor got it wrong. We just think the doctor made it the wrong assumption about who they were and they just change it. They weren't really allowed to do that by the policy, by any stretch of the imagination, but they just kind of, they imagined the doctors, they imagined this mis imaginary mistake on the doctor's part to change it. So like that, like that kind of work I think is super important. Um, and I kind of like that kind of work with the problem or that the, those kinds of policy on the fly. But the problem is that like, it doesn't provide like people with security and rationality in terms of knowing what kind of outcome they're gonna get. And the kind of people who are gonna be more likely to work those systems are gonna be more privileged. So good question. In the back, yeah. um, my question has to do with this idea of uh, gender versus sex. I think that had been addressed several times. I know that there is a currently ha there's currently a materialist turn that is pushing more for this idea of sex over gender, and the discourse such as Christopher Brew's work in defense of sex. However, I th I think if we look at how this is operating um, through the enumeration, such as through the Census Bureau, we see materially that it's moving towards uh, 
a wider enumeration through uh, such categories as race, now including ethnicity, and these types of categories. And so I just wonder um, if there is, uh, if you could draw an exception in the case of, uh, you know, looking for more rights as uh, I'm not sure of the other speaker's name, but the ways that the state playing an active role does create the visibility and rights that would uh, lead towards uh, maybe some would say liberation, you know? Yeah, no, and that also gets a, a point of Catherine's that I wasn't able to to get to. But yeah, I think like having more enumerated categories, more options, more choices, all those are all those are good things. They they keep us locked into a system of recognition that makes us think that if we're recognized as liberal subjects, everything is okay. But it's good to it's good for things to be sort of okay. So I think that's a pretty fancy way of saying it, isn't it? Um, so I do think I'm not I, I'm not I'm not against all those I'm not against like enumerating categories for for people to kind of meet their their needs. But one of the things I point out in the book, and it's I think it's like the fifth chapter, and people have probably stopped reading by then. But like we get focused on like these non discrimination laws or the exact right sex classification policy, which they're important. But the three things that would change the most trans people's lives the most are prison and belt abolition, a national, you know, public health care plan, and you know, a, a huge, hugely effective attack on income inequality. Because if you look at the statistics of people's people dying in early death, they're not distributed between red states and blue states unevenly, right? So like it's not so great to be trans in Ron DeSantis' Florida right now. But it's not like people in New, it's not like New York is Nirvana. So this is the same kind of thing that happened with Trump, right? Trump was look, Trump was a bad guy. He looks really bad, and it makes Biden and the Democrats look good. And they are not good. They are also producing these policies that like cause people to like, you know, die earlier. So so I think we just have to do kind of do that thing that you know is kind of keep both these agendas in mind at the same time. Like even as we try to get people what they need in terms of recognition, not always be drawn into that logic. You have any other questions? Uh, Sonia. Um, Sonia, you can use the mic so we can. I was wondering if in your research, if you had come across the, um, the historical resistance to name change and would that or not name change as a function of gender or gender change, but name change through dissolution of marriage. And what that research had re revealed about the, res the administrative resistance to um, to that kind of change, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of of this uh, of of marriage as a project of patriarchy. So I'm assuming historically, name changes that came through dissolution of marriages or divorces, they there must have been a process at different state levels or administrative levels or agency levels that. Um, either allowed for those kinds of changes to be made or um, had certain provisions in place. So I was wondering if if your research had shown what that was like. Um, and also if, um, um, I have one more point that I'm thinking of, uh, that it'll come to me in a minute. But uh, right, so, so I was thinking about name change in particular and whether it has to do with sort of like this geometric representation of what the utopian gender freedom looks like. Is it a blank or is it a square? So when you talk about categories, you're still thinking in terms of, of representation within checked boxes. Um, is it a question of, say, for example, the blank middle name, if it's in a, in a birth certificate? Some people have one, some people don't. Um, is, that, is that what you envision? as a certain level of freedom if you were if it were left as a blank line versus categories even multiple categories so that's my other question yeah well super good questions like i don't know about the matrimonial name change issue but that is like fascinating and it would be really interesting to see like what the differences and similarities were in terms of like regulating sex classification in the United States is a bit more of a free for all around name changes it's not quite like germany was recently where like you better name your child a gender conforming name but with trans people often you when you if you had you would your name change in your surgery or your, your name change your sex classification change, classification change would happen around the same time and they were supposed to like reflect each other and in fact early per, early versions of the new york city birth policy kind of required a name change to go along you couldn't 
go from being assigned male at birth and becoming a woman and keep your name John. So there's a certain kind of regulation. And we see that a lot in Europe with, with the regulation of names to be traditional a certain way. Um, in terms of like the, fu the future, as I understand your question, it's interesting, I'm with this Facebook group for trans PhD students. Um, and I posted like, oh, I just read this MA thesis where they just referred to all the pe people as they. Cause like who wants to look up the pronoun of everybody you cite, that's a lot of work. And I thought, I thought that seems like a cool idea. And people just went nuts. <laughs> they were like, that is not okay. I've worked hard, I've changed my pronoun. People better get it right. Of course, there's no like, you know, you can't just go find, you know, especially with with authors where they, they have like an initial in their last name, but you're supposed to get their pronoun right. So I, I thought it was like, couldn't we just move in some context to like a universal they? Like not in all contexts, but in some context. But like, I was really shocked. These are like, trans studies PhD students, I was really shocked at the resistance to the idea that like we could we could move away from like the specificity specificity of identity. So the delegation of sort of privatization of uh, or a, a delegation to the private sphere of the police power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we could have a whole discussion about the police power, uh, but we've run out of time. <laughs> so we're not gonna have that discussion. Instead uh, we're going to thank Professor Kura, uh, Che Gossett, Catherine Frankie, uh, for a, and you for a really wonderful uh, discussion. And uh, we hope that you will find your way again to purchasing this book, not just for the sake of uh, royalties, but because, I get, I get uh, eighty-four cents for every book you buy. So okay. come on. it should be clear uh, that uh, you will learn a lot from this book, uh, not just about the question of sex, but about yourself. And uh, that has to be a good thing, doesn't it? All right, thank you all so much. <laughs>